Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Amcor with Mike Kelly. We're going to talk today about the challenges of heterogeneous integration. Mike, we've got a lot of changes. Obviously, Moore's Law is, is having difficulty scaling. In addition to that, we're pushing into a lot of new applications, new features that are going into these devices. There's no longer just one thing that they're doing. They're doing many things, trying to do them all very well. What sort of challenges does that bring into the design and the packaging? There is a, an awful lot of interest going on in integrating multiple die, possibly multiple functions into a single package. And that's putting more onus on the package to bring system level considerations into a really small space. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Mike, what are we looking at? I, uh, this is uh, just a cartoon, of course, but I'm trying to show a couple of different integrated circuits, uh, a couple of different die in a single package. And you know, as you, as you look to compute especially, we're seeing more and more customers wanting to qualify this kind of package. And you know, the, key, the key ingredients here, the, you know, the, the venerable IC substrate's not going away, the package substrate, but the two die are communicating together in, uh, with some kind of interposer, which brings a lot more uh, you know, integration and bandwidth to this solution. In the past, these were pretty simple packages that put things together. A lot of them were ceramic, pretty basic stuff. This is now completely changed. What kind of considerations now do you have to think about with the package? You know, it's a good question. So when you start to put multiple die into a single package, uh, there's a few things that are front and center. Obviously, you've got to have, you know, some reasonable electrical path between these die so they can communicate well. Uh, it's not unlike a circuit board where, you know, in the, in, the, in the good old days, we had single die packages and they were integrated at the circuit board level. That was a large scale system. This is a small scale system. So same kind of net requirements, good electrical connectivity between the die. Now you've got two die with reasonable power output. So in, in essence, your power density oftentimes goes up a little bit. So we've got to get rid of uh, heat and thermal dissipation path needs to be enhanced. We're seeing some of that. And then I would say just mechanically and from a reliability standpoint, it's a more complicated system. But fortunately for us, in many ways, having this interposer here is actually enhancing our reliability. In the past, typically when people thought about packaging, it would just basically, basically be, okay, we're going to, going to encapsulate the chip. That's no longer the case, right? How does the packaging actually affect performance, power, and reliability? So in those days when we had, let's say we had a, a flip chip package with a single die in it, those signals had to traverse from this die out the package substrate, you know, into some kind of L2 interconnect down to the main board. That electrical path is, is just physically long. So that in some ways limits the speed. As you put silicon together more closely, you know, your, your line lengths here between die are short. Typically, you know, one to two millimeters is all, all the trace lengths you're talking about here. So electrically, that has a lot of benefits. This driver that's in this, in each of these die, often can be scaled down. That makes it smaller. It's also creating less power. So heat dissipation is, uh, is better than you might think. You've still got, you know, oftentimes these are large die being disaggregated into a couple of smaller die with, you know, functional splits. You still have the communication between these two, uh, but in essence, you're improving your electrical path uh, as you compare to a larger scale integration that might be a circuit board. It also helps that these signals are traveling shorter distances too, right? So now that you think, okay, we don't need to have as much power driving these signals because the distance is shorter, therefore the thermal dissipation is less of a problem that way as well. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in, in the two-dimensional case like we're showing here, a 2D uh, die integration, this driver is still much smaller than it would have been if you were driving a signal all the way off and over into the next device that's on the board somewhere. So you're benefiting from that. And then, you know, as you go from two-dimensional integrations to combinations of two-dimensional and three-dimensional, 
you know, we're already seeing those in the marketplace where you have a three-dimensional uh, angle to this. That, that I.O. driver may all but disappear. So it's, it's really just logic buffers between the two. You don't even need a full driver anymore. So you're benefiting from having to drive signals shorter lengths. Functionally, this is, all makes sense, but there's also design-wise now, you now have to think about the package as part of the architecture, which you didn't in the past, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you think about it, um, there's several cases out there. One, one case that we're seeing a lot of is this would have been a very large single SOC, but the yields are so low that departitioning that die into better yielding uh, functional chiplets, if you will, and reintegrating is, is, is one item. But I would say also that you know there's also a case out there where because you can integrate more in the package, you're actually building a package device that now has more functionality than a single die ever could. More transistors, more complexity between the die. You, you know, if you've got a high-end RF and a logic device, you can't just do that on a single die anymore. You, you have to have different dies. So it enables that kind of, uh, you know, mixed functionality pit, uh, path as well. Within a device, because this, these are getting heterogeneous, they're used differently, they're prioritized differently, applications uh, will change how they're used, different users will have different ways of, of looking at it. How do you deal with the, the different aging problems and how does that affect reliability? Yeah, and that, it's an interesting question. So, um, you know, inside this package, there are certainly dye that are being thermally exercised more than other dye, right? So when we think about reliability in the packaging world, we're always thinking about temperature cycles, right? And you've got CTE differences in here, which create stresses as you're cooling and heating. So, you know, that's, that's part of creating stress and that influences reliability. The, the, the idea here, normally these dye are as close together as we can get them because if you've got an interposer, you don't want to make that interposer larger than it has to be because that's a cost element. So really these are strongly thermally coupled. So even though this die might be getting exercised a thousand to one, um, you know, this die is, has a tough time not seeing the same thermal history that this die does. So mechanically and thermally, they're, they're very strongly correlated. So I would say, you know, the, the aging phenomena between dye is really only relevant if your dye are spread out so that their thermal histories can be different. In this case, everything's interlocked, and that includes the thermal and at least the age-related things related to thermal. So most of the chiplets that have been done today have been done by companies developing their own chiplets. The commercial chiplets are still on the horizon. What happens there? What sort of problems do you foresee in terms of... Uh, putting multiple chiplets together from different vendors, and then how do they actually work together? Is there a way of actually saying, this is going to work within this package the way we expect it to? Today, you're right. It's the, uh, the integrated guys pretty much designing all of the chiplets that go into this device. You know, that's, that's a common model today. But, you know, right behind that is sort of the, the uh, chiplet supermarket model that customers really would like to get to someday, right? especially for smaller companies. They're not going to be able to design and release all these chiplets. They need to buy chiplets in the marketplace. And in order to make that happen, a couple of things have to happen. You, you have to have a die-to-die -die interface that different companies understand and can design to with fairly rigid specifications. So you know if you put you know, vendor A and vendor B's chiplets in here, their, their interaction between these chiplets is going to work. And so, you know, those consortia that are out there, you know, probably the best I, example these days is UCIE. Um, you know, uh, big companies are all members, uh, as is my company. And that is really establishing a mechanical and, of course, an electrical standard for these chiplets to interact first time right. And, and I think that's that's absolutely mandatory to sort of get this chiplet marketplace going where, you know, let's say you design three or the four chiplets, but the fourth one, you know, the best one in the market is from someone else. You've got to know it's going to interoperate with the rest of your guy. 
The mechanical side here is interesting because in the past when you thought about putting chips into a package, it was probably plainer or it may have been one chip on top of another. The design tools that are out there don't necessarily address this. Is that starting to change? So certainly the design tools are getting closer to comprehending this as a single design. You know, the, 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 the easy one to think about is you used to have a single chip and you did all your timing and sign off because you were inside of a single chip and everybody knew what was going on. But this is the, still you've got timing considerations that have to be uh, sign offable when you've got multiple die. So, so I think that is, that is still required. Um, 3D is adding another element to it, right? Because, you know, you're in, in the physical world, it's easy for us to see this is three dimensional, but then how do you abstract that into something that, you know, is, is a Verilog or some, some kind of IC design tool so that it comprehends all that. And, you know, the, the big EDA guys are coming along nicely. Um, you know, and I wouldn't say it's 100% ready, but, you know, big customers are making it work. With chiplets, how does uh, assembly and packaging actually change? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of points to be made here. Clearly, you've got multiple devices that are in a single package. And most often, but not always, these are getting integrated in some kind of module. It's still true, you know, that these die might be actually sitting on the package substrate itself, sort of a classic MCM, and that integration is taking place at the circuit board level, at the package substrate level. That would be fairly typical. MCMs have been around for a long time. If you're doing a, a higher bandwidth interconnection here between these die, and these tend to be wide, low power interfaces, you need a fairly high density interposer to, to make this happen. And that is probably the key difference for the packaging industry, is you now have to have a really high density uh, integration scheme that allows you to connect these die so that you don't lose functional performance. You know, in some cases, perhaps you're even gaining just a little bit. And, and then because you're putting more, uh, more power generating devices together, we're seeing a trend towards just higher power per package. That is definitely coming our way. You know, more and more customers are looking at this and maybe, you know, if they have a, if they have a lid over this device, um, you know, you've got to have a very nice thermal path that the packaging guys can help you with here. And, you know, this, this Tim may have to move from the classic filled polymer type Tim to a metal Tim. And that's a big step, but we're seeing the high end of customers' portfolios needing to go to this kind of technology with, with metal, metal, metal Tim of some kind. Really what you're going for here is mass customization, right? You're trying to say, okay, we can now build a package that is at least standard enough that we can put all these pieces in and change them out. Yes, I think that is true. I mean, one, one of the strengths, you know, at a fairly high level is as, you, as our customers target different market segments, you know, they don't necessarily have to redesign a full custom die for every market. Perhaps there's combinations of these chiplets that you can, you can put together in a single package and, and address different markets differently. We've already seen that in the marketplace. And, and that allows you to you know, design uh, perhaps fewer overall custom designs, uh, but do that with integration in a chiplet environment in mind so that when you need to customize for different marketplaces, you're not designing a custom part, a custom IC for every one of these. I think that's becoming a really important trend for some of our customers. What happens when you put different materials together? So we've got silicon, we've got some of the power electronics which are going off of SICK and GAN. Do they all fit into the same package or is it still going to be separate? You know, I think, you know, as you think about, you know, bulk silicon and then other types of bulk substrate for RF and things like that, you know, it's, it's always stress because some of the, some of the RF substrates, you know, the, the bulk substrates are quite sensitive to stress. So it's, it's important to understand what kind of stress you're imparting into these die and, you know, can they handle it? 
And, you know, I think that is something where simulation has to be brought into bear. More and more of these kind of parts need a, a solid upfront mechanical thermal evaluation in the design cycle or even before. I mean, more of our products, uh, product developments that we're doing today, we generate this model before we ever get started because we know we're going to need it to optimize. And so, you know, it, the key is to manage stress. One of the things that's, you know, fortunate, but, uh, you know, fortunate for us is these type of interposers between silicon and packaged substrate tend to lower stress in the die. So it's a, a little bit serendipity, but that's kind of how it turned out. In the past, when we look at a lot of the, the large ships, the ones that were going reticle size plus, everybody thought, oh, it'd be really nice to be able to work in the Z axis. But now what we're seeing is that as they're working in the Z axis, people are compressing it down that way too. What impact does that have? Does it now say, okay, we now have to think about margin in three dimensions? Yeah, good, good, good question. So I think, you know, as, as we, we kind of sketched here for a minute, if, if you're adding three dimensional uh, silicon stacking of some kind, definitely some products are still very much Z height sensitive, right? If you're going into portable devices, you know, the Z height is always one of the paramount factories that, factors that you're trying to target. And, you know, interestingly enough, as you make these die thinner, um, they're more and more susceptible to hot spots in the silicon. You, you need to understand what that's doing to your complexity for warpage. So certainly you've got two-dimensional. That kind of two-dimensional warpage is very interesting and sometimes very challenging. As you add silicon, what you're really doing is you're basically adding a strength element in the z-axis on part of the device. And they're usually never symmetrical, which is, you know, always a compromise for stress, right? So I think, yeah, as, as these get compressed, thin dye, hot spots, um, as, you, as you stack dye, you're actually putting a high-strength member in the mix here that's different than the rest. You've got to have your simulations dialed in and know what's going to happen. And there's been a lot of talk about thinning out uh, some of the substrates too, right? That increases all the stress? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the trend and the desires to have a thinner core substrate, um, that's an electrical requirement because as you go through the substrate, there's a minimum via pitch. As that via pitch gets closer together, that helps your total impedance in that and usually uh, signaling off package. And so everybody wants a thinner core. A thinner core is just simply much more prone to warpage. Um, it also affects the, the effective CTE of this substrate, usually drives this down in, 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 C, in total CTE. So stresses do change. But the number one challenge these days really is there's no such thing as a flat package, right? There never was. But now that the complication up here, it is putting the onus on simulation, material selection, and, and process control to make sure that this warpage is still tolerable. In the past, when we think about advanced packaging, it was fan out, 2.5D, 3D. Those are pretty much the, the main advanced packages that were coming in. Then we had chip burst, chip blast. What's out in the market now? What, where do you see this actually going? Because it seemed like we had all these choices. Everybody was experimenting, trying to figure out which one works best, and suddenly we're now at a point where things are starting to mature, everybody's heading in this direction. You know, it's, it's a great question. I think there's, there's two big camps. There's the high density fan out interposer, which, you know, I've, I've drawn this over here. This might be a high density interposer with multiple layers of vias. This is more TSV where you've got vias all the way through. So let's, let's change this to, to uh, more of an organic type interposer. So for our, in, in the organic interposer space, what you're really finding is uh, there's two main camps, I would say. As you're integrating chiplets, um, one, one primary idea is to integrate these chiplets with a interposer constructed out of multi-layers of RDL, the organic interposer, so-called organic interposer. I would say the other major theme that's out there is using a bridge of some kind um, to do a lot of the heavy lifting between these die and that oftentimes is also integrated in with the high density fan out, but if you do, if, if your design is taking full advantage of it, 
your most dense, most difficult challenge for creating RDL is right here in this small area between the die, and that, that can relieve a lot of the routing requirements for the rest of the interposer. So the idea is, you know, create a, create a bridge that can do the heavy lifting for the detailed routing between the die, and then relax the requirements for the rest of the interposer, uh, all in, in uh, you know, looking ahead towards what could ultimately be a lower cost solution or could also be a solution that might extend itself into really large format manufacturing. Mike Kelly, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much, Ed.